Uh, welcome, friends. Uh, we have been uh, trying to understand the basic idea about uh, micro planning, and as you know, that uh, this whole idea, concept, and practice of micro planning is the essence of development economics. And we have three continuous modules on micro planning. In the earlier module, we have defined micro planning and not only we have defined we have given you, you the justification the need the urgency the significance the importance of micro planning further we gave you the case study based on the indian economy let me repeat this fundamental point just to hammer that micro planning is leading to decentralized development and leading to better quality of life, leading to sustainable development, leading to human development. You know all these, these are major concepts. And you also know that this whole idea of sustainable development goals, which are to be achieved by 2030, it is a UN resolution which has already been taken, can only be achieved if we focus on decentralized participatory process of development and it can only be done in a collaborative manner. As a student of economic science, if we understand the idea, the theory as well as the practice. So in the earlier module, we have blended these things. Now, in this module, I will just briefly touch upon the uh, two fundamentals which are associated with the process of delineation of a region. There is a very important theory called central place theory given by a very renowned geographer in the beginning of the 20th century and his name is Kristaller and it's a beautiful theory and uh, if you on the basis of understanding of this theory you will be able to correlate with the earlier module and very importantly it will help you to really initiate to really conduct some of your dissertation and future research studies. So we will talk about briefly about this central place theory. In addition, and again it's very important idea about the propulsive impact of economic activity around a geographic uh, arena and that is known as uh, the growth pole theory. If you say that growth pole theory is a very unique idea which was initially developed by a French economist called Parox. Later on many the geographers, the economists, the statistician work in that area. It is an important issue which is also concerned with the governance aspect. But uh, briefly, I would like to add here is that, you know Gunnar Medal, he got the Nobel Prize in Economics. He also analyzed the complexities which is associated with the development process, with the underdevelopment process and how the growth impacts in and around area. There is another economist, Paul Krugman, who also got a Nobel Prize. He initiated a lot of unique ideas within the broader framework, which we can call economic geography. So these two ideas can be blended in really uh, comprehending the concept of micro planning. 
Now, uh, before talking about uh, the idea of uh, central place theory, let us reiterate what we have learned till now that micro planning is the decentralized label participatory planning and we know that planning is an intervention of the government here at the micro planning the government we have a multi-level government system as we have understood in the last module and but the important role played for micro planning is the local self-government and this is everywhere across different countries in African countries, in Asian countries, in Latin American countries, everywhere there is a system of governance. So you have a local level government, you have a middle level government, what you call provincial government, like in Indian context you call state government, and you have a central government or the union government. And the planning is a very interesting coordinated effort which is to be made by different levels of the government. But as a theoretical uh, justification, what we can say that the local level government is best suited for the local functions. The functions which are ultimately provide the quality of life to the local people. So we have understood that this regional planning or micro planning is a location allocation decision. It is basically trying to uh, legitimize or optimize the spatial dispersion and economic coherence of economic uh, activities. You know, the spatial dispersion like you know how the economic activities are spread across the area travel by air you can see down over the land and you will see that there is a settlement pattern there are villages there are agricultural lands there are various interesting things and and that settlement pattern is uh, basically uh, influenced to maximize the social choices by introducing or by inducting micro planning. So the spatial dispersion and coherence of economic activities can be done very effectively if we induct the integrated area development planning. So there is another name of micro planning is the integrated area development planning. And in that, we explicitly treat space because the space, the land is a very important component of the whole process. So it is in this context, my um, suggestion to you is that uh, you focus on the coming two theoretical framework. The first is the central place theory and the next is the growth pole. Now let us specifically focus on the uh, conceptual framework of central place theory. Here as I was mentioning that this theory was initially given by Kristaller. Kristaller, a German geographer, he was trying to analyze the settlement pattern in and around the villages, the urban areas in Germany. Later on, there are some more uh, social scientists like Losch further elaborated this whole idea. But the Kristaller's theory is really beautiful to, is a beautiful theory. What we can call, it is a beautiful geometry of uh, a special uh, you know settlement where we try to analyze the size of the region the location of very 
economic activities and the clustering of economic activities. So before we talk about this whole settlement process which ultimately leads to delineate a region and that ultimately helps the government for uh, planning intervention at the local level. So first important point here is that if you see any space, any land area, so you have to identify a central place. So which means central place theory, the first important dimension is that you have a special point over the land which is delivering the various economic functions or you can say various uh, social functions and so the center is fulfilling the social and economic requirements of the center itself and the adjoining area because that itself is a very important uh, concept. So this is the first point. Second point is that the central place theory assumes that a central place and the adjoining region means that a central place along with the adjoining region is having a larger area which means that the node which is the central place itself is not complete it has certain dependent settlements which are located around the center so this is the second important point that the area larger than central place is served by a central place there are roughly we can say in a very relative term central place is an independent settlement whereas the other lower level central places are dependent settlement for various functions so which means that there is a settlement hierarchy suppose there is a village and the villagers go for health facilities to adjoining town so town is a central place providing a function to the villagers and villagers are going to the town for getting the health facilities similarly for marketing facilities, for uh, education facilities, for so many other kind of facilities. So this is the second important point. The third important point is that central place is an important place because it is important in many ways. It is economically important in terms of population, density, there is a larger population, but the size of population itself is not important. If you see uh, the whole ecological setting of central places, there are mountains, there are, there, there are deserts, there are coastal areas, there are islands. These central places are there everywhere. But they have certain unique features which is associated with the, its importance. Importance basically, we can say it is not the size itself of the central place. It is basically the functions which are delivered by the central place to the dependent settlements. Larger the central functions, larger is going to be the importance. The service delivery extended by the central place is more important that shows the importance now the fourth point is that the central place is the source of various goods and services that itself is very important which means that there are certain services which are available everywhere and there are certain services which are not available everywhere that's uh, very important. The goods and services which are 
not available everywhere are located at the central places the, in a very simple sense this is the meaning of uh, the sources of goods and services which are extended by the central place to the dependent uh, you know settlements like you know i can give you one example uh, suppose the primary health services are available maybe in some of the villages but suppose i am suffering from a major disease you know and some very complicated operation is required for that disease then definitely for that particular functions i am dependent on the central places a bigger town where a big hospital is there you can imagine wherever you are that how these functions are being delivered take about education okay suppose a primary school schools are located maybe in some of the areas like in the mountains like in the coastal areas like in the islands even there is a problem of locating primary schools because you do not have the number of minimum you know number of students so that is called the threshold population which means that for a particular surviving for a particular function you need a minimum population like you know suppose i am a shopkeeper i i need a minimum number of uh, consumers who can purchase so that i can at least uh, enjoy my little bit of profit otherwise i will shut down my shop so that is the fundamental principle and this is called the thresholds and uh, the central level functions are in a very simple sense not available everywhere that's why the people who are living in the dependent settlements or in a very simple sense we can say the people who are living in the villages are visiting the urban areas for uh, various marketing functions health functions educational functions various other kinds of functions even judiciary functions even police functions and lot of other things are there the fifth uh, important point is that uh, that is central place is having a complementary region the region for which development planning is being done at the decentralized level you may just recall that in the last in the earlier module what we have done we have identified various types of region one is called homogeneity based region other one is called functionality based region and third where you try to blend homogeneity and functionality is called the planning region but the basic uh, idea about central place theory is that it talks about the functionality dimension which is more important however the homogeneity dimension is uh, also relatively important i can give you one example like you know homogeneity dimension means suppose you are in the mountain area suppose you are in the desert area this is homogeneous area but within that area you have to see which are the functional central points and uh, that itself is very very important so the idea of complementary region is ultimately to delineate the boundaries and central place theory tells us by using a simple geometrical framework that how the boundaries of a complementary region or complementary area are decided on the basis of the central place theory and the last dimension of this whole process is that it is called range and distance range and distance both are the same thing in a way which means that if there is a central point how far you know people of the complementary area are located those are coming for getting various services can they come daily can they come weekly or whatsoever but it is decided if you leave everything to the market it, it is decided based on 
the cost effectivity based on a lot of other things. So here in that, in this context, there is a special range of central place. So range is basically the distance from the central point. So this is one and second is the threshold. Threshold means as I was just mentioning is that that is the minimum population which is needed for retaining a particular function. Suppose you open a hospital, highly specialized hospital in a very in an area where you have a very low population then the cost of that hospital or the cost of that suppose you talk about education or some of the other uh, marketing uh, point so that is important so i hope by now some of the fundamentals of central place theory would have come into your mind basically in the present context this whole system helps to improve the governance and when you talk about governance it is basically that it is the least cost effective process of delivering various social and economic functions through planning if you see what a government does where government spends money government spends money in all these kind of activities you can take any government you might have studied uh, unique uh, issues concerned with indian planning system you might have studied unique issues which are concerned with public finance there are separate papers so ultimately the point is that you have to locate a function over a space and then uh, you have to do the investment and the decision of locating a particular investment uh, is very important and if it is minimizing the transaction cost maximizing the benefit it is okay it will ultimately a social choice now on the basis of that now let us see this whole all these six factors how they work so we can talk about the process of development of central places now the this is called central place geometry now just you think about you take a piece of paper and draw some kind of imaginative a dot on the piece of paper and then decide the boundary you can use full paper half paper whatsoever is your choice but what i am saying that you draw those regions now while drawing the least cost maximum benefit size of central place wherever you talk about it is a circle means the center of that circle is the central place and joining complementary regions are the periphery now if i ask you to draw four or five circles and these circles are you know only touching the boundary because if these circles are overlapping which means that there are conflicts what just for simplicity what we say that okay draw four five six seven eight nine whatsoever circles but the condition is that these circles will only be touching the boundary of the periphery so what you see as you see in this diagram that there are certain gaps suppose there are four circles within that there is a gap which cannot be uh, supported by a central place so what is the way out kristaller says that the best way out is have you ever seen the honeycomb the natural process where they collect the honey so these are the honeycomb honeycombs are not in circle these are hexagonal now you see what what i am drawing here is that 
the circle are now converted into hexagonal form and in a hexagonal form interestingly there are no gaps as you see in this diagram there are no gaps so this whole system and when you talk about hexagonal forms it is means six triangles are fitted if you fit these six triangles with one center so this is the hexagonal shape now this is called a central place geometry it's really very interesting and many of the uh, followers of crystaller they try to analyze and still we can say that uh, this crystaller's theory is a very static theory but interestingly that is still as relevant in the context of regional development and micro planning now it is the what we call it is the triangular hexagonal packing of service areas triangular six triangles putting in a hexagon just you see in this diagram now this hierarchy now there is a hierarchy of settlement it is not that one hexagon will be there there are so many hexagons which means that so many settlements wherever you are pursuing your higher study you see around your your place you can see lot of independent central places one independent central place becomes a dependent central place for a higher level of functioning and that hierarchy goes on that hierarchy goes on and interestingly i would love uh, if you analyze this whole issue of central place settlement in the context of information communication technology revolution which we call disruptive revolution how the whole process of centrality has been disrupted by the ICT revolution that itself is a big area where I hope that someday you you produce one very unique uh, theory on this idea so I'm just provoking you but here let us focus on this central place geometry the triangular hexagonal packing of service area is decided by what crystal calls k value roughly there are three types of uh, hexagonal uh, packing or what we can can say that there are three principles to decide the hexagonal packing the first principle is called marketing principle second principle is called transportation principle and third principle is called administrative principle now the marketing principle where the k value is 3 and the transportation principle is that where k value is 4 and the administrative principle is where k value is 6 now if you see this hexagonal pattern here is that the region is the central places decides the region which is in a hexagonal framework on the basis of marketing principle marketing principle basically is minimizing the cost and there is a system there is a system but system is based on the k value the second important uh, principle is called transportation principle now there is a little difference in the marketing and uh, transportation principle you see is that all the six points of hexagons you are drawing a straight line and these straight lines are the transportation routes which means that the k4 value is basically decided by the direct transportation routes between smaller settlements as you are seeing in this diagram 
So, which means that between two smaller settlements, between the transportation direct routes, there are bigger settlements which are located. Uh, basically, the transportation principle and marketing principles, ultimately these are the two varieties of deciding the complementary area of the region or of the central place. There can be a a disformity in this hexagonal pattern based on the transportation principle which means that the practical understanding we are not going into all the kind of details but just in the context of macro planning as a student of economic science as a student of development economics we are trying to understand that how this whole idea of centrality is important in the context of micro planning so this transportation is a very important. These are like, you know, veins and nerves, you know, helping our heart, you know, to pump into the, into the whole system. And that's why every government is focusing on transportation network. And there are various ways of transportation. You have land transportation, sea transportation, you have various kinds of transportation. In the urban framework, you have seen that there is a new system of transportation. In different countries, you have a different transportation. When the land uh, surface area was not sufficient, then we decided the underground transportation. So the transportation itself is a very important di dimension of deciding the complementary area of the central place. And the third dimension is the what we call the administrative principle you know as we understood in the last module is that there is the central place is an important place like say it is the headquarter of a particular administration and rest of the other you know complementary settlements are dependent for administrative decisions so the complementary control over those decisions and this is called k6 which means that in a hexagonal pattern all the six dependent settlements because a hexagon has only six points so all these six points as you see in this diagram are dependent on the central place so all these three principles the marketing principle superimposing the what we call transportation principle, further superimposing the administrative principle creates a central place geometry. So I hope you have enjoyed this. Now let us link with this central place theory. Let us link the, the growth pole approach because the central place, although it is a geographic point, it spurts the vibration of growth within the center and around the complementary area and how it works is being understood in a very interesting manner under the growth pole theory as i was mentioning you might have heard the name of krugman who got the nobel prize in economics and even long back in 1969 um, Gunnar Middel got uh, a Nobel Prize in economics and both of them they tried to analyze the Parox fundamental principle of a growth pole that we'll discuss now. In the regional planning process, the theoretical framework which is required to be understood along with the central place settlement hierarchy is the growth pole a theory. There are, uh, during the 60s and 70s, there are a lot of growth related uh, theories. But here in the context of growth poll, we will be focusing on how this growth poll approach is to be taken care in the process of regional planning. As we have already understood that when we talk about regional planning, we 
are mainly talking about integrated area development which is really helping us to take appropriate location allocation decision. So it is in this context a brief review of growth pool is interesting. When we talk about growth pool the 60s uh, of the 20th century is very important. It talks about that whenever wherever in the process of development uh, there are economic activities which are being concentrated and especially during the 60s the industrial economic activities other than agricultural activities are given more important here it is in this context you might be remembering theories which was given by Schumpeter is focusing on innovation using that Schumpeterian approach a French economist Parox talked about uh, the unique uh, scenario of sectoral dualism what he he was talking about a growth pole idea that within a particular sector or within a particular industry there are certain propulsive industrial forces which means that there are there are certain factories certain firms certain industries which take lead in the process of development and that creates a kind of imbalance and uh, this kind of imbalance we can say it is a kind of backwash effect within the system means that there are like you know it is a kind of balance and unbalanced theory of development so initially there is a kind of backwash where one particular economic activity takes the lead in really development process however it has its positive impact in the long run and then we can say that there are certain spread effects where the income and employment in the other sectors in the other activities in the other industries also increases so this was a basic idea which has been floated by Perox based on Schumpeterian approach of innovation. There was a geographer during the same phase of 60s. Bodivili converted this idea over the geographic space. What he was saying that uh, the the location of a particular lead firm or lead sector creates a kind of regional imbalance so the dominant industry or dominant economic activity firm locate at a particular point and that creates a kind of uh, backwash effect and the backwash effect ultimately leads a kind of imbalance in the development process within a particular region where the functional nodes we know that functional node or an urban area or an area which is providing goods and services to the periphery its development becomes more faster than the complementary region and this whole process is in the time sequence this process start percolating in the periphery area in the complementary area and uh, the benefits are being used by the complementary area in the other sectors and so on so I think in a very classical sense it says that initially there will be backwash effect because uh, there are various factors for backwash effect which you can call about economies of scale which you can call uh, about uh, the uh, locational cost and other things but gradually in the process the uh, the spread effect is visible in this sequence there are two Nobel laureates 
who played a very interesting and important role. One is Gunnar Middle. And Gunnar Middle again talked about uh, theory of cumulative causation or what we can say that uh, it is circular and uh, causal interaction among various forces which creates a kind of enclave and periphery situation. He used a very interesting word called enclave where which are to be formed at the particular functional nodes. It can even be seen in the broader development process and what he was saying especially during 1957 and 58 there are a lot of publications where he talked about uh, the backwash effect which is creating uh, imbalances and uh, the spread effect but he was more concerned about the cumulative causation of backwash backwash effect which are more concerned with the enclave formation you are fully aware that Gunnar Middle was institutional economist and his whole approach is known as institutional economics approach where he said that this whole process of circular and uh, causal interaction leading to a cumulative causation of in, uh, enclave formation and regional imbalances is mainly caused after blending the economic and non-economic uh, factors and then uh, you know we can say that the institutional factors where the attitude the work culture and a lot of other things are there so the contribution of Gunnar Middle which is ultimately in today's context we talk about the governance it is the economics of governance the process of management of the things and a lot of other issues are important in the managerial system so Gunnar Middle talked about the role of non-economic variable which is the attitudes in a particular system as you might be knowing that a man is poor because he is poor so this kind of attitudinal framework is interesting and that is uh, a very unique contribution of Gunnar Middle. In this process again the Hirschman is talking about that there are in the process of regional development there are certain negative forces there are certain positive forces negative forces creates the concentration of economic activities whereas the positive forces creates the positive impact over uh, the economy and uh, basically it uh, talks about a lot of um, other important economic factors in this process there are a lot of uh, other uh, contributors but uh, a very interesting uh, point has been um, raised by another uh, Nobel laureate Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman again gave a new idea to this whole complex uh, phenomenon of uh, regional development as a new economic uh, geography where the comparative advantages are being analyzed within the region and between the region and uh, the core and periphery relationships are also being analyzed. Krugman is again you know in a, a reiterative form but in a more deeper way of analysis he said that there are uh, what we call centripetal forces means you know the forces which are creating inequality in the regional uh, framework where the concentration of economic activities and reverse to it there are centrifugal forces where you see the diffusion forces they having the spread effect and what he was saying that these both the forces are acting simultaneously and ultimately the impact of these forces can be seen on the process of regional development. Now ultimately when all these forces are working you can see the migratory process of the labor, 
locational advantage of various economic activities, expertise of the labor forces, ultimately the competitive environment and all these forces have a cumulative impact on the original development framework or this particular framework is further impacted by various um, you know aspects ultimately what we can say that uh, in krugman's understanding is that in the initial phase we see the backwash backwash uh, because there are certain comparative advantages which are reducing the cost of production compels a particular economic activity or a particular firm or a particular industry to locate at a particular point there is migration from the periphery area to the core labor mobility ways variation etc etc you can even compare this whole approach with the lewis model of uh, dual sector you can compare with the earlier theories which are not exactly in that micro planning context but uh, in the broader context of uh, growth uh, model you can see the role of investment role of uh, various lead sector in this regard but overall what we can say that gradually what happens the backwash uh, factors uh, reduces because uh, at the functional load, in a very realistic sense, you can say that there is a traffic congestion. There are a lot of other environmental aspects which are associated with that. Many times the firms, they prefer to go out of the node to the complementary area. It, it happens like this maybe because of a good transportation network maybe because in the periphery area you are getting a cheap labor so there is a wage differential and you wanted to maximize your benefit on the basis of a wage differential so ultimately the firm tries to analyze the overall cost impact of all the agglomerated and non-agglomerated factors so the transportation cost plays a very important role there are certain other aspects like transaction cost and so on so what we understood that specifically when we are talking about planning at the bottom we have to be very careful about these factors on which already literature is available now all these uh, aspects although are complicated but in this simple diagram let me summarize it that you see in this diagram it is a it has been drawn on a temporal framework you have uh, the backwash effect which is shown with the negative sign you have a spread effect which is shown with the positive sign and now what you are seeing that in the process of uh, development initially there is a backwash effect and uh, there is extreme backwash what uh, we can call that extremely polarized unbalanced kind of uh, framework and but gradually the backwash forces started reducing and uh, the positive spread effects as we have already discussed started playing a very interesting and very positive role and gradually the line which slowly you just see going upwards and there is a what we can call there is a point that is a zero point so the zero point and the starting point as you see in this particular diagram Generally, people say that it takes five to seven years, but not guaranteed that five to seven years depends on the process, the political economic aspects, and uh, so many things that we have already mentioned. And then after that, 
the curve goes up. It is almost a S curve you see in this uh, diagram and this is called net spillover curve and that is the overall impact of the development. So in a nutshell the growth pole theory is a very interesting theory. It can be understood in the broader context. However, in the context of regional development and specifically in the context of micro planning, the understanding will really help you to comprehend the whole complexity associated with the process of development. And this is one of the major problems being faced by the underdeveloped countries, specifically in Asia and uh, Africa uh, subcontinents. Now you can also see the issues which are concerned with migration, the issues which are concerned with urbanization, the issues which are concerned with the environmental degradation and so many things, the pollution and so many other aspects which are important in this process. And especially if you see, there are two ways. You can talk about micro planning even without understanding these factors. But the understanding of these factors will make you more, you know, confident to think about. Even you can browse a lot of other resources which are already available under the name of uh, the most prominent economists that we just talked about. So, in a nutshell, now let us summarize this module. What we have done? In this module, a continuity with the earlier module, what we have understood, we have understood that the geography, the spatial dimension plays a very important role in regional development and regional planning, which is very important. We have analyzed the central settlement theory. It's a beautiful geometric way of understanding the development. And we have seen that how the threshold, the range, the distance and other factors are very important and how the original delineation takes place, the boundaries takes place, role of transportation, a role of availability of raw material, availability of the labor forces, availability of the capital, all these factors are important in this context and then we have analyzed a very in a very simple sense the growth pole approach and this uh, growth pole approach is to be understood properly so that uh, as a regional planner we can take or the government can take appropriate decision which are concerned with locating a particular economic activity so that it can maximize the social choice. You are fully aware is that we are passing through a very unique transition where you have climate change, where you have disruptive ICT revolution, where you have keeping in view the democratic processes People are vocal and people are demanding quality public services and all these factors, if you blend all these factors, these factors can be covered within the broader umbrella of the social, of the sustainable development goals for which the United Nations have identified that all these sustainable development goals are to be achieved by 2030. And the, in this achievement, the, your understanding, comprehension and your role in really providing some of the good case studies concerned with micro planning can really help all of us. I hope that you have enjoyed this and uh, in the last um, module, I will give you real life practical examples from various aspects of human development where exactly the micro planning has been formulated and implemented by the government.
So thank you and all the best.